Hello, everyone, and welcome to the conference session, Relapsed Refractory Aplastic Anemia. Thank you for joining us. My name is Julie Powers, and I'm the Senior Director of Patient Advocacy at AAMDSIF, and I will be moderating today's presentation. As we get started, we recognize the generosity of our corporate sponsors and the generous support of our patients, families, and caregivers who have made financial contributions to this event. Immediately following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation from the Q&A icon in the engagement panel on your right. To submit a question or comment, type your question in the Q&A text box window, and when you have finished typing your question, hit enter. We will do our best to get to all questions. When asking questions, I respectfully ask that you do two things to help me manage the incoming questions. First, submit your entire question all at the same time. Second, please do not share private health information in your questions. Our speakers cannot answer specific questions related to your health care. During this session, we will also open polling questions from the audience to respond in real time using the polling feature and the right-hand uh, column panel of your screen. Please click on the icon on the panel to navigate between Q&A as you watch the session. The poll will only be open for the first five or so minutes and will help us prepare better uh, quality educational content for our healthcare professionals and our patients. So we look forward to hearing from you. Today's specialist is Dr. Bhavisha Patel. Dr. Patel is staff clinician at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the National Institutes of Health. She is the principal investigator on several clinical trials at NIH. With that said, welcome Dr. Patel. Thank you, Julie, for the kind introduction um, and good afternoon, everyone. Let me just share my screen so we can get started. Okay. And let's put this in. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Bhavisha Patel. I am a staff clinician um, and I work at the uh, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute um, in NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. Today, uh, my topic that I'll cover um, is focus of uh, treatment of relapsed and refractory severe aplastic anemia. My objectives, uh, here we go. The objectives for today, I think the presentation and um, discussion on refractory and relapse disease would be incomplete without initial, before, initially discussing the pathophysiology of severe plastic anemia and um, what are the current uh, standard first-line immunosuppressive treatment for severe plastic anemia. So I'll start there and uh, spend um, just a few minutes before moving on to the, uh, the uh, topic of discussions. So to start off, um, as you all are um, likely aware that aplastic anemia is a rare blood disease. Um, it occurs with the incidence of two to three million per year in Western countries. And for some reason, this incidence is double in Eastern countries such as Thailand, China, and Vietnam. And it is um, to date unclear as to why this is. There are many um, hypotheses, but nothing that is uh, definitive. Even though uh, aplastic anemia is considered a benign hematologic disease, um, most of our patients are ve very ill when they present um, and have a complicated course because of very low blood counts, um, all neutrophils, platelets, and hemoglobin, and the empty marrow that is not uh, producing cells that are um, important. Majority of our patients are um, younger, um, between the age of 20, uh, 10 to 25 years, but there is a bimodal distribution and there is an increased risk of um, bone marrow failure and aplastic anemia in people who are over 60 years of age. Um, back when uh, Dr. Neil Young, my mentor, uh, started the program and uh, introduced and uh, studied aplastic anemia, um, in the late 1900s, this disease was universally fatal. And now with um, many successes of uh, immunosuppressive treatment and also bone marrow transplantation, most patients are treatable either with first-line treatment or um, for second-line treatment, um, including hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So there are um, three 
broad groups um, that can result to what we call aplastic anemia. And just to define aplastic anemia, it is low blood counts, typically all three cell lines, um, as I mentioned, the neutrophils, the platelets, the hemoglobin, and also um, on the bone marrow evaluation when we see that the marrow really is empty. Um, to say that there is no um, evidence that could suggest that the low blood counts are due to a malignant process such as myelodysplastic syndrome or leukemia um, two differential diagnoses that are always there when we evaluate a patient with uh, low blood counts. Um, of these three broad groupings, um, the first on this, on this figure on the left-hand side, it's um, chemical and physical damage. And this uh, typically we see in patients who, receive, who are receiving chemotherapy, radiation, or have toxic exposure. And the one that's notoriously known is benzene. <laughs> Um, all of these agents, we, we know that there is um, a correlation between the dosage of drug um, and the exposure timing. Um, and majority of these cases are not permanent. Um, and uh, these um, bone marrow failure are reversible. On the right-hand side of this table, you'll find inherited marrow failures. And the two that we um, typically rule out in um, all of our aplastic anemia patients are telomere disease and Fanconi anemia. Um, for patients who are um, younger, uh, younger than 40 years of age, we do um, automatically, at least at the NIH, perform um, genetic testing and uh, specialized testing to rule these two disorders out. And for patients who are older than 40 years of age, um, if there is any concerning family history um, of other family members having um, uh, low blood counts or myelodysplastic syndrome or leukemia, we also do the specialized testing um, too to rule out uh, an underlying cause. And this is simply because we will discuss that the treatments are very different. And what we typically use for immune um, aplastic anemia, which is in the middle panel of this um, table, uh, which is also the most common um, of immunosuppression, typically do not work in these constitutional genetic defects. So the focus for the remainder of the talk will be um, in this idiopathic or immune-mediated aplastic anemia. And as as many of you may know that even though there have been some associations made with some diseases that lead to aplastic anemia, such as seronegative hepatitis, um, eosinophilic fasciitis, majority of the cases, we don't know why the immune system um, decides to target the hematopoiesis um, and aplastic anemia occurs. Um, but when we look at the, the bone marrow biopsy, all three of these um, uh, broad categories, they look the same. The marrow is empty. Um, there are not cells um, as they're supposed to be. And I have a better picture a little later on that compares the, the normal marrow and what it should look like and what marrow in aplastic anemia looks like. And again, um, this is just to reiterate that our focus will be discussing mostly immunosuppression and medical therapy, but I will touch on broad aspects of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in aplastic anemia. So let's just review what, what are the processes? What is a, a normal marrow's function? So just very basically, um, you have hematopoietic stem progenitor cells. These are the mother cells origin of all the other cells that broadly um, produce lymphoid um, cells and myeloid cells. Lymphoid cells um, and on this top half produce most of your um, immune cells. And these include NK cells, lymphocytes, B lymphocytes. Um, and they reside in either your blood or in your tissues like your thymus gland and your lymph nodes. The myeloid compartment makes up the cells that are usually circulating in our blood. And these are neutrophils, platelets, and red blood cells. What happens in aplastic anemia is are these T cells or T lymphocytes, one of your immune cells, decides and identifies the hematopoietic stem cells as foreign and marches an attack, which results in basically the myeloid lineage being wiped out. Um, now, I'm talking about severe aplastic anemia, and that's why I'm addressing it as all three lineages being down. There is um, a non-severe aplastic anemia um, group where a patient may have just thrombocytopenia or just thrombocytopenia and neutropenia and not have all three lineages being down. 
but the pathophysiology or the mechanism of disease is still the same, that the T lymphocytes are the bad guys here who march and attack on the hematopoietic stem cells. And here's a, the picture that I was talking about. So on the left, you see that the marrow, um, so these are just your particulates of the bone and here is your bone marrow. And you can see that there is a lot of blue and pink um, and blue are the cells and it looks pretty full. And when you compare it to the aplastic anemia marrow, you basically see just that there is fibrinous material and there are not many cells that are present. Um, and typically in severe aplastic anemia, um, the uh, bone marrow cellularity um, by definition is less than 30%, but most of the time it's five to 10%. So it's very obvious that the marrow is not producing. So with that, um, I just wanted to very briefly touch on what are the complications and why are these, uh, why are aplastic anemia patients so ill? So neutropenia is one of our biggest worries because unlike thrombocytopenia and anemia, where we have uh, blood products to replace and increase the blood counts, neutropenia is not very easily um, uh, improved. So we have to rely on um, antibiotics and um, uh, proper uh, precautions to avoid infections. And the, and the infection rate really increases when the neutrophil counts is less, um, less than 200 or 0.2, as some of you may be aware of the numbers. And um, here, the worry is not only bacterial infection, but also fungal infection. And these are the patients we really try to get to treatment very quickly. And that um, treatment could be uh, bone marrow transplantation, or immune media, um, uh, immunosuppression, whichever is available to be given to the patient quickly. For thrombocytopenia, majority of the plastic anemia patients do have um, low platelet counts to less than 10 and are platelet transfusion dependent. And anemia is probably what makes a plastic anemia patients feel the worst um, because this brings on uh, tiredness, shortness of breath. Some of our older patients who have cardiac disease sometimes uh, get exertional um, chest pain. Um, and our threshold, um, the, the guideline threshold is that we transfuse when hemoglobin is less than seven, but really we individualize that to the patient, for example, a patient who has cardiac um, disease, um, we oftentimes um, ask them, when do you have these symptoms? Um, and patient will tell us, you know, hemoglobin less than eight or 10, nine, this is when I start feeling crummy. Um, and these um, uh, are supported with the blood transfusions and these complications or symptoms reduced um, with transfusion. And here's putting it all together. Um, it, this is a very complicated picture, but I did want to highlight over here that even though we, we believe and know that um, the T lymphocytes over here called CTLs on this figure are the ones that are directly causing the, um, the attack on the hematopoietic stem cells, there are many co more components of the immune system that are playing a role. And slowly we are identifying what are the the crosstalks between this complex immune um, system. Going back again, we don't, in most of the cases, know the inciting event. And on the right side of this uh, figure, you'll see that the eventual result is that hematopoiesis is um, inhibited, uh, hematopoietic stem cells are destroyed, and the resulting effect is that we see empty marrow, and in the peripheral blood count, we see low blood counts. So let's um, talk about frontline treatment very quickly. Um, I showed, um, if you attended my talk last, um, last year, I showed the same figure. And um, I do want to highlight that the, the treatment approach differs um, and it, it, between the children and the adults. In children, the answer is transplant, transplant, transplant. Unless you don't have a transplant option, then you go to immunosuppression. On the adult size, because we know that, you know, from uh, the transplant studies and um, the outcomes vary and they are different from children outcomes, we are a little bit more careful in um, which patients a transplant is um, offered as a frontline treatment. The general approach is that if, if a, a MAT sibling a donor is available for a patient who's less than 40 years of age, um, we do um, and we do recommend allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, and if this is not the case, then immunosuppression uh, with l now is the standard therapy. And then I will uh, wait to go uh, into the refractoriness and relapse um, as we move along.
So here's the uh, standard medical um, therapy, immunosuppression, that is approved. So it's a combination of horse ATG, cyclosporin, and Altrombopag, also referred to as triple regimen. And with this, the response rate, um, and when I talk about response rate, is improvement in the hematologic parameters. Um, so a patient who was transfusion dependent is no longer transfusion dependent. There is improvement in the neutropenia. That we see in 80 to 90% of patients at six months, and the duration of the treatment is considered six months. If a patient responds, then cyclosporin is continued for another 18 months, and that's really the, uh, the treatment duration of a total of two years. If there is no relapse that occurs um, within that time period, and um, if a patient responds at the first six months. And this is improved uh, from the historical response rate, which was 60% with just horse ATG and cyclosporin alone. So certainly with that, um, you know, we do have fewer percentage of patients that have refractory disease. Um, and now I think, you know, depending on the, the individual um, patient characteristics and disease characteristics, um, we have 10 to 20% uh, of patients who receive immunosuppression um, with horse ATG, cyclosporin, and l pad that have refractory disease. And that brings on many questions, right? So pathophysiologically, or knowing the mechanism of disease, it makes sense to combine immunosuppression and l pad. Immunosuppression because it suppresses the T lymphocytes and l pad because it stimulates the hematopoietic stem cells, the stem cells that you need to make um, the peripheral blood cells. So what could be going on? Um, and it, it is different in each patient and in some patients we just don't know. And that would be the bullet point number three that I'll um, go into in a little bit. So the first question always is, um, does the patient not have immune-mediated disease? Um, and this used to be a question that gets asked later on after the first-line treatment is given. Now, most of the big centers and most of the academic centers do perform inherited marrow failure testing, be it with genetic testing or specialized testing, at least to rule out telomere disease and Fanconi anemia upfront. So that answer would be available. What would not be available are these new they're always, so over the past 10 to 20 years, there have been um, at least three to four new inherited marrow failures that have been discovered. So would the does a patient have one of the inherited marrow failures that we just don't know about? Possible, but less likely. Um, so that's one of the, one of the reason maybe why a patient would be refractory to immune treatment. What is another cause? There is a condition called hypoplastic myelodysplastic syndrome. And the reason why it's called hypoplastic is the bone marrow biopsy looks exactly the same as aplastic anemia. And um, in distinction to the, the run of the mill or the regular myelodysplastic syndrome that we see, these patients don't have increased dysplasia, cells looking abnormal, and they don't have um, increased blast really immature cells that is a marker of malignancy. So they, sometimes they're very difficult to distinguish patients who may have hypoplastic MDS from aplastic anemia. And that's always been the question. And we always go back to the bone marrow to try to differentiate. And sometimes it's just not possible. So in this situation, we use tools um, such as looking at the uh, genetic mutations that are acquired. And again, um, you know, now there is a practice where majority of the patients, when they're being evaluated for aplastic anemia, do get somatic mutation testing. So if a patient has a mutation that is more um, common in myelodysplastic syndrome, this is something that we would be aware of um, and would be um, able to be identified that maybe that is the reason why the patient did not respond. Um, and then one of the, the biggest sort of um, conceptually what makes sense is that there is extreme hematopoietic stem cell exhaustion, meaning that there is so much damage done to that, that hematopoietic stem cell compartment that even when you block the T lymphocyte, that there is nothing to come back. Um, there are no hematopoietic stem cells to come back. And in this situation, really, stem cell transplant would provide um, that, um, that, um, that uh, a hematopoietic stem cell group to be filled again. And then the big question that um, you know always is in our mind is 
is the immunosuppression that we give is enough? And this question was asked by Dr. Uh, Phil Scheinberg, who some of you may know, who worked with Dr. Young uh, prior to me and Dr. Townsley. And he, they did ask this question and they asked it in a very methodical clinical trial manner where they added agents to horse ATG and cyclosporin. Um, and the agents included mycophenolate, which is another immunosuppressive drug, um, or serolimus, which is another immunosuppressive drug. And they replaced um, in one of the trials horse ATG with rabbit ATG, which is considered a more potent um, of the two ATGs. And what they saw was there was no improvement in the response rate. So this is where the l pack came from because you know, multiple agents were tried in multiple different manners and adding more immunosuppression just did not work. So then um, stimulating the hematopoietic stem cells with l pack seemed to do the trick but not completely because as I said, we still have about 10 to 20% of patients who are refractory after receiving the current standard uh, first line therapy. So one of the biggest questions all of my patients ask is, um, what are my chance of responses? And I am able to tell, um, you know, as for predict what the response rates may be depending on the, um, the disease characteristics. Um, and basically what we look at are these two values, absolute reticulocyte count and absolute neutrophil count. And what we found, um, and this was recently published uh, by one of my colleagues, um, what we found are the patients who don't respond to treatment tend to have lower absolute reticulocyte count. And they also tend to have lower absolute neutrophil counts. Both of these translate into having a lower pool of hematopoietic stem cells to kind of return and uh, perform their job of uh, replenishing the um, blood, sound, blood count. So if when I see a patient who has a response, um, when I see a patient who has absolute reticulocyte count of less than 10 and absolute neutrophil counts of less than 100, I usually tell them that the response rate is around 50%. And although this is not published, this is the data that we're working on. Um, and unlike patients who have absolute reticulocyte count of more than 10 and absolute neutrophil count of more than 100 or 200, where the response rate is 80%, the response rate is much lower. And I also find and this is a little bit hard to you know, do statistics on, I also find that these patients are the ones who have been diagnosed and not treated uh, for a while. Um, whatever reason it may be, whether the diagnosis was incorrect or whether um, uh, the treatment was still being um, discussed or you know, in some of our patients' case, the patient is um, international treatment is just not available there. So even though we may not individually be able to tell whether a patient is whether we'll, a patient will respond or not respond, we would be able to. We are able to tell the um, the uh, the predictors so predict whether the response rate would be the 80, 90 percent or 50 percent. So moving on to treatment, what happens when a patient does not respond? We go back to the drawing board and assess um, whether hematopoietic stem cell transplant is a possibility. Um, most of the time, most of our patients, the reason why they received immunosuppression is because they don't have mad sibling donors or that they are older age, even if they have mad sibling donors. So in those situations, we look to see whether there are unrelated donor options or even alternative donor options. And when I say alternative donor options, this includes haploidentical half-match donors. Um, uh, this could be your brother, sister, or um, children, and for uh, young adults, it could be mom and dad, or um, umbilical cord options in some specialized institutions. If these are not an option, or if the patient is has comorbidities where they are unable to tolerate a bone marrow transplant, and we know that their complications will outweigh the benefit that the bone marrow transplantation will provide, we pursue second round of immunosuppression. And second round of immunosuppression um, is... Uh, Actually, I've arranged my slides a little differently. So let's go back to the different donors. And the reason why it's very important for us to consider donors um, is because the outcomes differ 
between donors. Um, the best outcomes that we know in every age group is with um, matched or uh, matched uh, sibling donor or HLA identical donor followed by matched unrelated donor. But now we have increasing data coming from Dr. Desern um, at Johns Hopkins and many other institutes who, who are able to replicate this data is that haploidentical donor with um, certain um, uh, adjustment of the of the immunosuppression given peritransplant is also showing very good outcomes. And this is amazing news for our aplastic anemia patients because almost every patient um, has a parent or kids and um, at least they have a donor. And then further um, investigation can take place whether the patient's able to tolerate the transplant. There are many more nuances, but you know, at least having donor options, which is such a big deal, um, is less and less of a problem in this day and age. So what are the complications that I'm referring to? And I think many of you are probably have probably heard about it. And um, one of my patients put it very nicely is that would I be trading one disease for another? Um, and the disease that we fear about is graft versus host disease. And this is a complication, which is also immune mediated um, and has two phases. It could be acute or chronic. And basically the, the mechanism is that the donated uh, stem cells um, or not the stem cells, the donated uh, lymphocytes view the recipient um, body as foreign and mount an attack. And in this situation, the attack can be in any organs. Um, it could be skin, liver, um, pretty much any organ, including the, the hematopoietic compartment. Um, having said that, I do want to mention that the, 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 the rates of graft versus host disease are decreasing with improvement in better immunosuppressive prophylaxis, especially in the setting of alternative donors, like we have seen in haploidentical um, donor transplants. And treatment are also improving uh, with alternative agents um, other than steroids that was uh, the only available option for a very long time. So wheels are moving, things are improving, and more and more patients are becoming transplant candidate um, in the second line setting when immunosuppression does not work. Um, and this includes some of our older patients. So what if, um, you know, donor options, more available, great, but it's still um, not uncommon, at least in my patient population, for me to encounter patient who is not, who in whom transplant is not an option. Um, and this patient, these patients typically tend to be older, not fit patient, uh, where the complications and the um, the mortality rate is just not something that um, is tolerable to consider um, a stem cell transplant as the second option. And also um, patients who are mi mi minor ethnic origin or mixed ethnicity, um, only child who just do not have um, uh, donors available that still exist. In these patients, what we consider is second round of immunosuppression. And second round of immunosuppression traditionally is chosen between rabbit ATG, so it's exactly like horse ATG, but a different formulation. And if you recall, it's studied and shown to have um, response in a second line setting, and it is believed to be more immunosuppressive. So the thought is that that's how it works. Um, it is given with cyclosporin. Um, we don't currently have data to combine it with Altrombopac um, or Campath. And Campath or Elemtuzumab is a monoclonal antibody unlike the horse serum. Um, and it is typically immunosuppressive enough for a long period of time, typically four to six months by itself without the requirement of cyclosporin. So it's given um, uh, alone as a monotherapy. What are the response rates we're looking at? Um, so unfortunately, patients who don't respond to first-line immunosuppression um, uh, only have a chance of about uh, 30 to 40 percent of responding um, to second line of immunosuppression. Now there are caveats to this, and this, you know, the percentage should not be hold as you know a strict value because we do have where patients, some of our patients in front line setting, um, respond, but not enough that they meet criteria. Meaning that you know they were receiving platelet transfusion every week, and now they are receiving it every month. 
um, in those patients when they receive second round of um, immunosuppression, perhaps the rate is a little high. It's very difficult to actually study and show this in a statistical manner, but there are response rates that could be higher or lower than what's reported um, in studies. Um, but generally, we say about one third of patients respond to the second round of immunosuppression. Um, and how to choose between the rabbit ATG and CAMPATH, and that really is um, the experience of the physicians who are giving the drug because the response rate is the same, because the toxicities are better, better managed when you, ha you have experience of giving the drug before. Um, and generally, uh, the third round of immunosuppression is not recommended. Um, you know, before um, when I went back and looked at uh, some of our practices and also just general practices, when we did not know, um, you know, in the 1990s, patients would receive third, fourth round of immunosuppression, but it became very clear that if you're not to respond to the second round of immunosuppression, that the likelihood of responding to the third line is low. Now, the only thing um, is worth mentioning over here is if a patient has not seen L-trombopat previously. So uh, first line of treatment, um, for some reason, had not included L-trombopat, a third round as L-trombopat could be considered because it's a different mechanism and could provide um, responses as we have published in our L-trombopat monotherapy studies. Supportive care is extremely important. And um, I can't stress this enough that, you know, patients who were having horrible complications previously when supportive care was not um, as good as we have today, um, they did have many more uh, complications and lifestyle limiting complications. Um, so generally when I talk about supportive care, I'm talking about platelet transfusions. They're a nuisance, but platelet transfusions really avoid bleeding complications. Um, RBC transfusion, there are bigger um, complications with the red blood cell transfusions. And the question always comes up, well, when can we start chelating iron? Because the more uh, transfusions you receive, the more iron that accumulates. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have dedicated data to aplastic anemia patients. So we rely on the guidelines of myelodysplastic syndrome. And um, uh, this is probably not going to be a satisfactory answer, but the decision of when to start the, um, the iron chelation is really individualized to the patients. And most patients where we foresee that the transfusion requirement is not going to go away, and we see that the iron is building up, generally we recommend that um, iron chelation is started. For infection prevention, this question always comes up uh, from providers who are not used to uh, taking care of aplastic anemia patients. So we actually don't recommend um, antibiotic prophylaxis, um, no matter how low uh, neutrophil counts uh, is and the the rationale for that is that you know when you when you use one drug as an antibiotic prophylaxis you're basically just allowing the the the, the bacteria that we harbor in our gut to become smarter and become resistant to that drug um, and treating a resistant organism is much more difficult than one that is not so general recommendation no antibiotic prophylaxis Antifungal prophylaxis, although there is no um, strict consensus and guidelines for aplastic anemia, we and other um, experts do use prophylaxis when absolute neutrophil count is less than 200, because if you recall, this is where we really see uh, fungal complications um, that could be uh, detrimental. Um, antiviral prophylaxis, um, such as acyclovir and valacyclovir, typically are used uh, during and after immunosuppressive treatment. Um, so patients who um, receive horse ATG receive this um, antiviral prophylaxis for about 30 days, unless a patient has a history of recurrent herpes outbreak or something where the, um, the duration may have to be modified. Um, for CAMPATH, um, because as I mentioned that this is a very um, good immunosuppressive agent and the duration is very long, um, antiviral prophylaxis are generally continued for six months or longer depending on how immunosuppressed the patient is. PCP prophylaxis, PCP is a type of um, infection that we particularly see in immunosuppressed patients. And um, 
uh, that's why we like to prophylax patients. And typically um, in our patient population, pentamidine is preferred, but there are some oral options that we um, use when pentamidine is not an option. And this is also um, used during and after ATG and CAMPATH. And for CAMPATH, the duration is longer. Why am I mentioning this? Is because in refractory patients where the, you know, the treatment may not effectively work um, despite our best efforts, all the supportive care becomes very important to avoid complications, to provide the best um, life that the patient can have, meaning they are able to do their activities um, with the blood transfusion. They are not you know, constantly getting admitted with infections if you properly um, use the precautions and properly use these prophylaxis um, to prevent infections. So just to wrap up the refractory disease, the take home points, and I am uh, talking a lot, so I'm going to speed up over here. So the take home points um, with the refractory disease is that to decide on the second treatment, there are many factors that are con uh, considered, and this includes age, comorbidities, performance status, donor availability for transplantation, and ultimately patient and family wishes. Some patients just do not want to go to bone marrow transplantation, and we acknowledge that and we respect that. And there are, you know, pros and cons that are to be considered for each therapy. And we do, you know, when we get to the second line treatment, we do encourage all of our patients to meet with a transplant physician um, and we provide our opinion on the immunosuppression and that way they can make informed decision as to which way to go once they know what their options are. Um, and as I would like to um, mention that, you know, the decision, decision um, in many cases is not straightforward and it has to be individualized um, to the patient. Um, and uh, many, it's a multidisciplinary um, uh, decision with many physicians involved, patient involved, oftentimes family members involved. So with that, I just wanted to give you a quick case. Um, so this is a 16-year-old uh, young male uh, diagnosed with aplastic anemia one month before um, uh, he presented to the NIH for an evaluation. Um, at diagnosis, the blood counts were very low. Um, and I want to highlight that the epsilon neutrophil count was less than 100 and ARC was less than 10. So as I mentioned, his chances of responding to the first-line therapy was about 50% but he did not have readily available um, bone marrow transplant options. He was an only child um, and um, did not have a mad sibling donor. His bone marrow biopsy was consistent with aplastic anemia. And because his epsilon neutrophil count was less than 90, although we sent all the genetic testing to see whether he had any genetic mutations, we don't wait in these patients. Um, we get started with the horse ATG cyclosporin out thrombopath as soon as possible. And then this patient, I think it was started within four days. Um, so results came back. University of Chicago was negative to indicate that there was any inherited um, disease. Um, donor options um, uh, donor options were really not um, uh, 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 big options available other than mother being a haploidentical donor. Uh, the patient had a fairly rough course with aspergillus, which is a fungal infection, and re uh, uh, received a pretty aggressive treatment for it, as we do for all of our patients. Um, and patient ultimately went to uh, transplant um, a mother as a donor uh, after two months. Uh, after two months because the patient was just not stable enough to go to transplant. The infections have to be controlled before a patient goes to transplant. And at the last follow-up, a couple of weeks ago, the patient was doing well, but the blood counts are still low and still recovering. Let's talk about relapsed aplastic anemia. So this is, these are patients who have response at six months. Um, and at some point after six months, either during the maintenance phase of cyclosporin or um, many months and years after, have decline in blood counts. Relapse is not as straightforward um, as the initial diagnosis and as uh, at the initial response assessment, because there are many different pr presentation. Um, we find that sometimes we see a slow decrease in one of the blood counts, and typically it's platelets. Platelets are notorious to go down first and come up first. Um, so uh, a patient may have a very slow trickle um, down of the platelets, or in some scenario, we see that there is abrupt 
decrease of one or more um, multiple blood counts. And one that really um, causes us to address uh, relapse very quickly is if I see a neutrophil count drop very quickly and consistently and staying low. The reason why it's so difficult is because there are many conditions that actually in our aplastic anemia decrease cell counts that are only transient, um, and some of which are viral infection, pregnancy, my pregnant patients who get pregnant um, after being um, uh, in remission for a long period of time really keep me at the edge of my seat because their blood counts do drop. And it's hard to determine who's going to kind of stay there and go into full-blown relapse and who's going to recover. Um, so a pregnancy, big major surgery, we oftentimes see that the, the marrow when it's under stress um, can um, have the de decline in blood counts, but some of these, I would say about 50% of the patients recover, 50% or actually low, don't quote me on that number, um, may eventually um, develop a relapse. So the, the conclusion is that the trend for us is very important and not a single value. Um, and this is, is oftentimes very frustrating and anxiety provoking to my patients when you know they call me with saying my platelet counts drop from 220 to 180. I'm worried and I say, don't worry, just you know, let's just get another a lab in about a week and then we see 160. Um, and it's still not to, for me to definitively call the relapse because the alternative is that I may call a relapse for something that may stabilize by itself and subject a patient to therapy that um, may be um, lifelong um, and come with complications. So it's really important for us to be sure that the trend is a relapse and it's difficult. Um, at the NIH, um, our definitions have been consistent, but also very broad, um, is that you see a decline um, that is consistent, uh, persistent, um, and no stabilization is seen. So what have we tried in the past um, to prevent relapses? Um, what we have tried and what we think has worked um, the best, even though it's not perfect is to extend the cyclosporin rather than just stopping it at six months. And this we observed in our most recent protocol as well, where when we stopped the cyclosporin and ultrombopec, both at six months, the patients had, I mean, our relapse rate was around 60%, um, which decreased to 30%, um, which is typically what we see one third of patients relapsing. Um, so one of the things that we um, absolutely recommend and practice is that after six months, the initial high dose cyclosporine, we do continue the cyclosporine maintenance, a lower dose once a day for 18 months. So what about the triple regimen? So um, you are seeing this data that is not published, but um, it is soon going to be published, um, which is that, um, with the triple regimen, so this is our protocol that was initiated in 2012 that resulted in the approval of the addition of L-trombopac to the immunosuppression. Um, we saw amazing uh, response rates at six months, so the, the number of re refractory patients were lower. Um, but unfortunately, we're still seeing um, the same number of relapses. So about one third of patients, if you could see this curve, um, tend to relapse. But what we learned from this protocol is that um, the relapses have a very unique pattern, is that they tend to occur after the cyclosporin is uh, discontinued and l trombopec is continued. And again, when the cyclosporin maintenance is discontinued. So this is the period where we watch patients really carefully. Oftentimes we do blood work weekly to kind of get through this period to make sure that they are okay um, and they are not having a relapse. Can we predict relapse? Just like refractory, we're unable to predict relapse, but we do know that older patients uh, from our recent data have higher risk of relapse. Um, you know, it would be intuitive to think that a patient who has a complete response, meaning blood counts went to near normal ranges at six months um, would not relapse, but this is really truly not the case. And we're tr still trying to understand, you know, what is the underlying process that is causing the relapse? One of the thought is that, even though the blood counts recover, there is still low lying immune dysregulation that occurs that gets triggered again 
Um, so it, it never really goes away that there is a, a dysregulation that is ongoing, just not um, uh, clinically apparent. So um, just as I mentioned for the refractory, the, the treatment is individualized, but there is a uh, flow that we follow in most patients. And in our patients who are treated with the triple drug regimen, um, in the first line setting, the first thing we do um, is restart the cyclosporin. Um, we evaluate the response in about eight to 12 weeks. And if there is no response and if there are no um, contraindication to l pack, we add the l pack, give about eight to 12 weeks. And if there is no response, we move on to the true second immunosuppression, which is rapid ATG or LM2zumab or bone marrow transplant. Now, the reason why I say individualized to patient is, say a patient had really steep decline in the neutrophils where the neutrophils went to zero. And we know that that patient um, is a young patient who has a match unrelated donor. In that situation, we may start the cyclosporin, but may not wait um, the complete eight weeks. We will start the transplant workup simultaneously, just temporize the patient the best we could and get them to transplant as soon as possible. And historically, with this, um, with this approach, we have seen that 70% of our patients do respond to the strategy, um, but the response may not be durable and may the patients still need to proceed to alternative therapy. So every patient of ours who relapse, we evaluate them uh, for a transplant. So we look for donors, we ask them to go see a transplant uh, physician to really hear about it and you know, know about transplant as an option um, because it is a big decision. Um, and we encourage that this, this decision is not made in an emergent setting and that um, some thought has been placed, you know, because um, it, to provide informed, um, you know, informed information to decide one way or the other, I think is very important when a patient reaches at this stage. Um, and just like in our older um, cohort, um, the patients who receive l as the first line, we see that when we start the oral therapy, when they relapse, either cyclosporin or cyclosporin along with l about two thirds respond. And um, the other one third are refractory and these patients usually are moved on to um, transplantation um, or second line of immunosuppression. And the drugs are the same as refractory um, to work with. So it's either rabbit ATG or CAMPAP. But um, I would like to highlight over here that the response rates are higher. Um, it's about 50 to 60% with rabbit ATG and about 50 to 60% with CAMPAP. And the reason being that the patient showed that they had immune mediated disease that is responsive to immunotherapy. So that's why we uh, we feel that the second line treatment, they're responding better than the patients who have refractory disease. Again, as to which one to choose, rabbit ATG or CAMPAP, our preference and um, our recommendation is um, CAMPAP because we do feel very comfortable with it. Um, we are confident on um, our trial data. And the biggest thing in our mind, um, and Dr. Young always says, is that, you know, Campath really frees you of using cyclosporin, and cyclosporin really uh, um, has um, a lot of side effects. And the side effects um, that are um, that are detrimental tend to occur um, uh, when a patient takes it for a prolonged period of time. But at the end, physician comfort and experience with managing the complications um, really drives which therapies used because the response rates are the same. Uh, bone marrow transplantation, um, in interest of time, uh, what I'll mention is that, again, uh, for children and young adults, um, this is considered, um, even if there's alternative donors available, um, to be uh, performed before, um, without, before going to second round or in lieu of going to second round of immunosuppression. On the other hand, in our older adults where they're... Um, their rates of complications. I'm sorry, that's my son, my son. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so a second round of immunosuppression in older adults um, with, uh, without donors, um, and, but it is individualized to the patients based on their blood counts availability of mat sibling donor, et cetera. 
So let's talk about quickly a second case um, of a patient who relapsed. So this is a 27 year old female who was in usual state of health until a week prior when started noticing having some fevers, malaise, gum pain, and bleeding. Um, as you see, the uh, blood counts were low, um, hemoglobin 0.4, neutrophils 100, um, and platelets 13. And I did not put absolute uh, reticulocyte count over here, but um, I think for this patient, it was in the 20s range. Um, the bone marrow biopsy was consistent with aplastic anemia. There was no leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, and the patient was started on our triple regimen on our protocol. And um, this is a little hard to see, but um, you can tell that at six months, the platelet counts were around 100 and the neutrophils were well above normal. And um, for this, the patient was called to have a complete response. But unfortunately, as you could see, as the time went on, um, and this is one of the scenarios where there was an abrupt decline of two blood counts. And as you could see, this patient made us very nervous because the absolute neutrophil fill count went nearly to zero. So um, with our protocol, uh, we started the uh, full dose cyclosporin, patient didn't have a response. We added the L-trombopag and um, amazingly, uh, her neutrophils went from less than 200 to 800. So this was good because as I mentioned, it's very difficult to replace neutrophils. And this is where patients mostly get in trouble with infections. But the patient still remained blood and platelet transfusion dependent, so we thought that this was not an adequate response for this young person um, who did not have a readily available transplant option, and that's why we're going through this immunosuppression um, uh, regimens. So basically, this patient ended up receiving CAMPATH um, after we gave a trial of about, um, I think it was uh, three and a half months. And the patient at six months did not have response to CAMPATH. And this is where we reintroduced the L-trombopag um, with, uh, now this is not approved, but we know that L-trombopag works in uh, patients who have refractory disease to immune, um, uh, immune therapy. And here we saw that uh, the patient with that combination, improved his blood counts, uh, her blood counts uh, to near normal range again. Um, currently, she continues to be an L thrombopag. Unfortunately, the patient did have a COVID-19 infection, uh, which led to transient decline in blood counts. Um, and then following that, any attempt at decreasing the L thrombopag, because we always try to um, uh, taper the L thrombopag and cyclosporin to off. It was not successful, um, and patient remains all the on the L trombo pack. The transplant plans because the patient is not it, it's extremely complicated. Um, they continue to be on hold because she is doing very well, and um, the the blood counts look uh, stable with L trombo pack. Because L trombo pack is a new drug, um, and when used in high risk myelodysplastic syndrome setting showed that it may have some predisposition to um, uh, uh, progressing those patients with high risk myelodysplastic syndrome to leukemia. We, are, we do perform frequent bone marrows on our patients and have not found anything abnormal in hers. I do want to spend, I, I'm sure there are questions about COVID-19 infection, vaccine, and aplastic anemia. Um, and what I'll share is our recent uh, case report. Um, uh, what I'll start off by saying is that our patients are very good um, at isolating, and majority of them have um, uh, not contracted the infection. Um, the four that we heard about were at different stages of their aplastic anemia from uh, initial treatment. Two patients were um, had a relapse and were on medications. One was on cyclosporine maintenance, so fairly early on in the aplastic anemia disease, and one um, had uh, many years of remission, and these are different um, colors represented over here. And as you could see, just general trend that there was no, you know, during COVID-19 infection, there may be a little decline in the blood counts, but majority of them recovered. Now, with the, with the exception of one patient, this patient who had, was on cyclosporine maintenance, um, that patient um, had uh, um, uh, recovery, uh, but then unfortunately relapsed. Um, 
since then, there have been other publications and uh, case series, as you can imagine, aplastic anemia is such a rare disease. Our patients are really good at isolating themselves. So there is not a, a lot of data out there, but we are seeing uh, patients who have a decline in blood counts, um, uh, relapses, uh, have uh, a COVID-19 uh, infection that leads to hospitalization, but there is no clear trend to say one way or the other. Um, but with uh, the disease itself, COVID-19, irrespective of having aplastic anemia, we do feel that vaccine um, is indicated and we recommend all of our patients to receive vaccination. Um, um, except for the patients who are um, who are just diagnosed um, and are in the initial stage of receiving treatment, not because we don't think vaccination should be given, it's because we just don't think the vaccination would be effective when you are on heavy immunosuppression. But I would also say this discussion needs to take place with a hematologist um, regarding uh, whether or not COVID-19 uh, vaccine is recommended as, you know, there may be some individual circumstances. Quickly, I want to mention that we do have, because as I mentioned, relapse is still a big problem um, in our patients. Um, we do have a uh, protocol that is ongoing where we are trying to use a medication serolimus at two-year time point when the patient comes off of the cyclosporine if they have stable blood count to see if there is a short course of serolimus, which is a drug that's slightly different than cyclosporine, can induce tolerance to decrease the um, relapse. And the reason um, why we believe is because we have some early um, uh, evidence from mouse data and also from transplant, transplant literature that serolimus gets rid of active immune cells, unlike cyclosporine. So if there are immune cells that are coming up and active serolimus will hopefully get rid of them um, and decrease the relapse rates. Um, serolimus has an excellent safety profile, um, so we are um, not experiencing any increase um, uh, toxicities than what has been reported previously in the patient in our patients, and we do mo monitor the therapeutic levels very carefully, just like cyclosporine. And um, this protocol is halfway accrued. I don't have any results to share with you today um, because it's too early to know, but we are hoping that um, our hypothesis um, will be answered, whether serolimus um, is able to decrease the relapse or not. Um, there are some lessons that we learned uh, from our ongoing study with the triple regimen is that the relapse tend to occur uh, when the treatment changes are made. So the, these are the time periods when we are very, very careful and monitor our patients constantly. We are still trying to answer the question about the ongoing immune attack and what is the ideal dose and duration of immunosuppression. We are considering, depending on what the results we find for serolimus, whether serolimus could be brought up front um, in the regimen to prevent uh, responses. And currently we're also looking at, and I've not included a slide, slide on this, but um, uh, to look at refractory disease and what could be used in refractory disease, other um, agents um, uh, that are used um, in other immune-mediated uh, immune diseases. Um, I'll skip this slide in uh, interest of time. Time, uh, but basically that there is another complication of aplastic anemia patients that we uh, monitor for, and this is evolution to myelodysplastic syndrome, occurs in about 10 to 15% of the patients, but the one that we worry about the most, which is um, uh, frank myelodysplastic syndrome or chromosome 7 abnormality occurs in about 5% of the patients. And the reason why I wanted to mention this in this um, discussion is because the patients who have multiple relapses and the longer the disease is active, we find that um, this complication may be a little bit more prevalent. Um, these are all the ongoing protocols at the NIH. We have two protocols for first line. 
Um, I do want to mention a protocol that we have of early oral initiation, where we initiate cyclosporine and all pack as soon as we know that the patient has aplastic anemia without waiting for all the specialized testing. Once we have the specialized testing, we confirm that the disease is immune mediated, then we get force ATG. And the idea is really to, to put the brakes on that um, immune mediated attack to preserve the hematopoietic stem cells. So when we do provide the immunosuppression that the hematopoietic poises can um, come back. Um, as I mentioned, we have a relapse prevention trial, and we also are interested in our lab um, in inherited disease, particularly telomere disease. Um, I would like to thank all of our research participants. Without them, uh, what we do would not be possible. What we have learned and what we know would not be possible. And we're continuing our efforts to learn more about this disease to really address these issues of refractory disease, relapse disease, and clonal evolution. Here's our all the whole group uh, with our fearless leader, Dr. Neil Young. Um, and here I am, I photoshopped myself in because I was um, on pregnancy leave at that time. And this was this picture is unfortunately two years ago uh, since we have not been able to gather, um, but I'm hoping that this will change soon. Um, thank you all for all your time. Um, and I'm just a minute over. Um, Julia, thank you so much, you. Dr. Patel. We do have a couple of questions that were submitted. So we're going to go a little, just take a few extra minutes um, and get through these real quick. First question is, do you consider PRCA a separate disease or a subset of aplastic? Yeah, this is actually a very good question. Um, we do consider PRCA as a, a spectrum on a spectrum of bone marrow failure. Um, and I would say they typically fall under the non-severe um, aplastic anemia or bone marrow failure or unilineage marrow failure. The reason I say this is because the underlying mechanism of immune mediated attack is the same. Um, we generally don't treat um, a PRCA as aplastic anemia, but the treatment is still immuno, um, immune mediated um, targeting the T cells. Thank you so much. Um, this, uh, we have a patient who has a clarification question. Um, I think that they maybe, we maybe misheard or you misspoke that um, uh, they thought you said two to three million cases of aplastic per year, but did you mean two to three per million? Per million. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> it's rare. Then the math works out to about just under a thousand new aplastic anemia patients a year. Okay, great. And then um, let's see, uh, this patient says, I was on Dapsone, but it caused hemolytic anemia. Now I'm on, um, I'm going to say this wrong, um, a tovaquone mm -hmm. to replace it, but I'm still on 125 milligram cyclosporine. I haven't needed any transfusions in a year. Yay. Um, and we'll be on cyclosporine for six months more. Do you think that I will continue to need to take the atovaquone or however you say that? No, so um, that's a very good question. So this um, alludes to the PCP prophylaxis um, and the drugs that we typically use are um, pentamidine, um, uh, dapsone, and atovacone. I'm sorry that you had that complication, um, but it is a complication, unfortunately. So atovacone or PCP prophylaxis um, will most likely be uh, discontinued once you are off the um, high risk or the high dose cyclosporin because it's really the, the T cell decrease that um, increases the risk of PCP. Thank you so much. Um, if, uh, the last question, and if we didn't get to your question, just send it to us at help at aamds.org and we'll get, we'll get it answered. Um, what blood counts indicate to you severe, apla severe aplastic anemia relapse? When should l peg be reintroduced if blood levels fall after it's discontinued? And do you believe that l peg is a long-term treatment for severe aplastic? Yeah, um, two questions, both very good questions. Mm -hmm. Um, so <laughs> I think I, I stress this enough that it's, it's individualized and it's very difficult. So looking at trends, um, uh, I'll just give you an example to hopefully clarify this further. So if a patient was to have um, 70 as their baseline platelets, this is the best response they achieved um, and they are it's holding steady at 70. If I start that 70 decline, I see 60, 50, 40, 30 that would to me indicate a relapse versus if I say, if I see 60, 50, and then it kind of stays at 50, I would 
I would not call that second scenario relapse. So a persistent trend downwards of one or more lineages would be indicated as a relapse. And in that situation, either cyclosporin or oral thrombopag um, could be considered um, as a treatment. To address your second question, um, l um, um, as I said, for patients, when we achieve the best response that we are to achieve with cyclosporin or l or the combination, we do start tapering it down and we always attempt to taper it off. Um, and in many of our patients, what we see is the second time around when they require the l very slowly, sometimes over months to years, we are able to slowly taper it down. So even though it is one of the treatment um, that is used for a longer period of time, our attempt is always to taper it down because we don't have um, complete safety data for its use long-term. And we monitor our patients very carefully with bone marrow um, biopsies. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. If you do want to watch this session again, it will be available on the conference platform in about an hour. Um, you can go to the top of your screen and select sessions, and it's avail it will be available on the on-demand section. Um, if we didn't get to your questions today, or you think of something after we're done, just send an email to help, H-E-L-P at aamds.org, or give us a call toll-free at 1-800-747-2820. Be sure to visit our exhibit hall and folks don't miss our speaker at uh, 145 Eastern, which is in just nine minutes. This, this our speaker is a phenom, a phenom uh, has survived aplastic anemia, PNH and MDS and is here to tell you all about her survivor story and to inspire all of us with her story of hope. On behalf of AAMDSIF, I wanna thank Dr. Patel for being with us and thank you all for joining us today and making us your resource of choice for bone marrow failure diseases. On behalf of the board and the team here, um, we are so grateful for your support and then the privilege of serving you for the last 35 years. This concludes our session. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Thank you, everyone.